I'm going to show you uh, some nuclear physics that uh, adds to what we've done in the SL part. Uh, first of all, we have this equation. Well, I like this from Big Bang Theory. What did the nuclear physicist have for lunch? Fish and chips. Uh -huh. um, and so a nuclear physicist, he actually had a boat and it was called Gone Fission. Get it? Uh, so there is a nuclear radius. This is an equation that's in your data booklet. I haven't seen it show up many times on exams, so I won't spend much time on it, but it says that the nuclear radius R is of an atomic mass number A. Remember the atomic mass number, that's the number of nucleons. Remember that when we write an element, let's say, I don't know, like, um, I don't know, something like helium, let's say. The atomic mass number is would be this top number. That's the number of protons plus neutrons. In this case here, it's got two protons. So because this is four, we know that uh, two protons plus two neutrons is the way to get four. Anyway, you can basically figure out the nuclear radius. This is always in meters, of course. Um, and they'll be very, very small numbers. Expect really tiny numbers, okay? Um, and that's just the equation. Let's go on to something maybe that's uh, more likely to show up on exams. First of all, uh, just a reminder of this curve here. This, uh, If we have the number of uh, atoms, let's say, or it could be a mass. It could also be activity, by the way. Activity could also be this. Uh, remember this curve? It's exponential. It goes something like, I'm not really drawing it that, that well, but there you go. We start off at 100% of something, then there exists a time where you have 50%, right? That's this value right here. We call that T one half. That's the time to get half of the original amount or mass or activity. Uh, then, because I'm trying to go quickly so I can spend the time on the things that do show up most on exams, um, let's just remind ourselves about alpha decay and how it works. Remember how alpha goes? Alpha decay means you end up just adding, you always just add a uh, helium four. That's what it means to have alpha decay. And remember if you have beta decay, there's two types. There's, whoops. I didn't write that very well. There's something called beta minus, which is an electron. But every time you get beta decay, don't forget, you also get a little electron neutrino. And this gives you here of the anti-neutrino. Because from particle physics, you need a particle and you need an antiparticle. We have the other kind of beta decay, which is a positron beta decay, it's called. And because this is an antiparticle of the electron, then you're okay with just the electron neutrino, the normal kind. So I'm just trying to remind you what happens with these kind of decays. Uh, now let's go more detailed about this uh, decay curve. I think that's the really important one here. So decay is exponential. I want to go into more detail because we can have, we have this equation here for n and it's an exponential. I mean, notice this curve is exponentially decreasing, right? So because of that in physics HL, we actually break in and do some details on this equation. So we have n equals n0 e to the minus lambda t. And I want to point out one thing really important. Lambda is not the wavelength. You might think so because you're used to only seeing lambda being the wavelength. You might have thought that was one of the only safe Greek letters. That always means the same thing. But nope, it does not equal the wavelength. In nuclear physics, it's called a decay constant. And that's the probability of a decay happening in a given time. It's measured in like seconds to the minus one, or you can say, you know, years to the minus one, it basically doesn't matter too much, but some unit of time, like one over time. Now this equation, the way it works is this, uh, you have n, which is your initial mass, but you can also write it for activity. In other words, we can write the same equation, instead of n, we can say a equals a zero e to the minus lambda t. That's allowed. Okay, so the activity works the same way. And remember what activity is? Activity is decays per second, which is measured in BQ, we call them. These are Becquerels. Okay, so named after Becquerel, oddly enough. Uh, so this is, we have something else called activity. So we can have either the number of atoms, for example, here, or we can have the mass, or we can have the activity. They all work in the same way. And we have this nice little one right here that relates activity with the initial mass. You just have to throw in this lambda, this decay constant again. Now, what's interesting is that you should really know how to do this derivation of the decay constant and the half-life equation, because this is something I think it's really, really important to know. Um, also because uh, this is not in your data booklet. I can't find it at least, uh, unless it's in a secret place, I can't find it. So we have this equation you should be able to come up with to relate lambda, this decay constant, with the half-life. And I wanna just briefly go over with you how we actually do that derivation. It's good news, it's not hard. So how do we do the derivation? Well, we start off by saying, uh, we're gonna use this equation, n equals n zero, uh, except we're gonna define something. We're gonna say at t equals t one half. In other words, when we are at the half-life, 
Can you tell me or think about what do you think n is compared to n0? In other words, what do you think your final mass is compared to your initial mass? And I hope it makes sense to you that n is going to be equal to n0 over 2. Why is it over 2? Because that's the definition of half-life. It's the time where you have half the original amount or activity. So because of that, then that's what we put in here, and that's all we need to do in order to solve this. Now we just need to do some math. So the physics is over, now it's just a math question. Let's see if we can do it. So instead of n, I write in n0 over 2. So watch carefully. So n0 over 2 equals n0, that's the equation here, e to the minus lambda. Instead of t, I put in t1 half. All right, well, good news, my n zeros can cancel out because I can divide them both and you end up with one. So now I have one half. I'm going to show you every step, okay? So one half equals e to the minus lambda t one half. Now, how do I get rid of an e? You have to think about what's the opposite function to exponential function. And you might remember this or maybe not, I don't know, but you take the natural log of both sides. So do natural log of one over two equals the natural log of e to the power of well, let me just cancel that out. Turns out natural log of e, they undo each other. So it's like this top part, this minus lambda t one half, sort of the e disappears, so they just sort of falls to the bottom. So it's like minus lambda t one half. Now you gotta remember your rules of logs. Remember this from math class maybe, that turns out the natural log of one over two is the same thing as saying natural log of one minus natural log of two. That equals minus lambda t one half. And then you got to think about what's a natural log of 1. Think about that. We can do it. Uh, that's just a log base e of 1. I like to write sort of equals x, so I don't know what to do here. And then I do this to the power of this equals this. So I know that e to the power of what equals 1. And the only thing I can bring e to the power of to get 1 is 0. If I make e to the power of 0, I get 1. Therefore, I know that this answer is 0. Therefore, I know this thing right here is 0. Because of that, I have minus ln2 equals minus lambda t1 half. Do you notice what happens with the minuses? They're going to disappear. They're going to become pluses. All right. So basically, do you notice now I have, let's say I can solve for t1 half, couldn't I? I can say t1 half equals, uh, let's see here, it could be ln2, natural log of 2, divided by lambda. And this is the equation you need to use. Of course, you can do the other version. You can say lambda equals ln2 over t1 half. So this is super important, but do you see how you can do the derivation? It may not be very fun, but if you try it once or twice, you'll be fine. Now comes an example. Because by the way, um, you are fully expected in physics HL to be able to solve for t. They do expect you to be able to get to t here. In SL kind of questions, they're always really simple, where it's always a multiple of the half-life, so it's really easy. In this case, nope, it can be any time. Here's an example from an exam. So it's an exam poll. Uh, sorry, that's too bad. So we have a, a sample of cesium-134. So let's maybe uh, write that down right away before I forget. So it's uh, cesium-134. And I don't know which uh, atomic number is. We'll just leave it. Has initial activity of this number. So this right here, this is A0. A0 equals 4.7 times 10 to the 8 becquerel. I know its half-life is 2.1 years. All right, so I know t1 half is 2.1 years. And you can leave it at years, actually. You're allowed to do that. Now, what's a decay constant? That's lambda. So remember we have this equation here. We have t1 half equals ln2 over lambda. So you can see I can also say then that lambda, I guess if I multiply both sides by lambda, I have lambda equals ln2 over t1 half. So I'm going to put that in. Lambda is ln of 2 over t1 half. Let me calculate that. It's ln2 over my half-life, which is 2.1 years. I notice my units. I'm going to get lambda is something over uh, years. So I'm going to do natural log of 2. I'm going to divide that answer by 2.1. I end up with lambda is 0. Point, I'll do two significant figures, so 0 0.33. And I can say years to the minus 1. All right. That's my decay constant. That tells me the probability of a decay happening per year. In this case right here, it's not very big. Um, well, it's actually fairly big. I guess it's 33% in a given year. Uh, well, I guess it's not really much. Um, let's calculate the time in years. It takes for the activity to drop to this amount of becquerels here. This is, uh, let's figure that out. So here, if we want activity, we can do this equation for activity. 
I showed you it, it was this one here, a equals a0 e to the minus lambda t. So here I want to solve for t, but I got to put in what I know here. I'm given, uh, let's put it in purple maybe, a, the final activity is this 1.7 times 10 to the 7, that's Becquerel's, that's the final activity. The initial activity we're given is 4.7 times 10 to the 8, e to the power of minus, and here we put in 0 0.33, now this is per year, and I'm going to multiply that by time in years. So the good news is it'll all work out really nicely, I think. We just got to divide these two numbers. So I'm going to do 1.7 times 10 to the 7 divided by this just to figure out what answer I get here. So that equals this right here. So let's do this. So 1.7 times 10 to the 7. Take that answer, divide it by 4.7 times 10 to the 8. I end up with this number here, 0 0.03617, something like that, equals e to the whatever, whatever. Now what do I do to solve this? Remember, I do ln of this answer. That equals minus 0 0.33t. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to do ln of this answer. So ln answer. I get some number. And I'm going to take that and divide it by t. See that? So t is going to equal, I'm going to get some number here. So do you see I would do ln of this answer here. I divide that by negative 0.33, I end up with an answer of t equals 10.059. Now I'm allowed two significant figures, aren't I? I've got 2, 4.7, 2.1, yeah. So I can just say then t equals just 10, I guess, years. So this will take you about 10 years uh, to have an activity go from 4.7 times 10 to the 8 decays per second down to 1.7 times 10 to the 7 decays per second. So this is this is sort of what it tells you here. Um, I think this is really important because, we see, we practiced how to do this uh, by solving for t. So this is how you can deal with these kinds of questions, and I hope you found that helpful.